Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Disaster Resilience Analytics Center seminar series. Uh, it is a great opportunity for us to have uh, here uh, Julie Stimson, who is the Sedgwick County Emergency Management Director. She is responsible for building and um, sustaining disaster prevention, preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery capabilities for 21 local jurisdictions that has a total population of over 500,000 people. She's a retired Air Force Master Sergeant with 13 years of military public health experience and seven years experience in emergency management. In her short time as the Sedgwick County Emergency Manager Director, uh, she has managed three different disaster declarations, the ongoing COVID-19 response, the severe cold deep freeze in 2021, and the April 29, 2022 Sedgwick County and over uh, EF3 tornado. So let's hear um, her. Um, welcome you for the talk, Julie. You can go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to talk about disaster recovery. Um, it's a phase of disasters that doesn't get a lot of attention. And the, um, like it was mentioned, we are actively engaged with the April 29, 2022 tornado um, disaster that hit here locally in Sedgwick County, Butler County, and Andover. And uh, we are currently in the recovery phase of that disaster. So I'm going to kind of talk about it and explain disaster recovery through the eyes of what we are currently experiencing here locally. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, can you guys see? There we go. You guys see the presentation? Not yet. Not yet. All right. Okay, I think we can see the presentation now. Okay, should be a picture of a tornado. Is this disaster recovery? Yes. Fantastic. All right. And I'll, let me. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Pardon me. Let me get this situated. All right. So, on April 29, 2022, around 8 p.m., uh, we had an EF3 tornado that came through our area. And that is one of our biggest risks here locally is severe weather, be it winds. Um, hail, strong thunderstorms, wind, and tornadoes. Um, so that's a photo of our um, April 29 tornado. And today I'm going to talk about a few things. We're going to briefly talk about the emergency management hierarchy and how disasters start at the local level. Uh, talk a little bit about federal assistance, what happens when we do qualify and what happens when we don't qualify for federal assistance. The national preparedness goal and how all of this ties together to build um, prepared and resilient communities. We'll focus on the recovery core capabilities and the recovery phases. Um, talk about whole community involvement and participation in all phases of disaster, but particularly in recovery. Um, the National Disaster Recovery Framework, and like I mentioned, we'll kind of talk through this Andover tornado as an example of how these um, things are being activated. And then we'll talk about preparing and planning for recovery and then share some resources um, for folks to um, determine what needs to be planned for and how to go about planning for it. So I mentioned the National Preparedness Goal, and this is a goal that pretty much uh, tells the country how do we plan for, prepare for, and respond and recover from any type of disaster, all hazards approach. So we're talking things of man-made disasters, um, acts of terrorism, natural disasters, um, and, and industrial accidents, just, just about anything that can disrupt a community um, is something that we're trying. One, we're going to try to prevent or we're going to protect against, and that pretty much comes into um, anti-terrorism type threats. Mitigation, which is reducing our vulnerability. So when we know we have these hazards, what are things that we can do to reduce the impacts of when those disasters do happen? Um, response, we do really, really well with response. Um, we're always telling people, you know, if a tornado comes, you, you get underground or you get inside your interior room. Our first responders um, are so prepared to come out and respond to disasters. Um, but then when that excitement wears off, there's a whole other phase of disasters that we don't get to see in the news and we don't get to talk about a whole lot. And that is the recovery uh, portion. Um, a lot of things around recovery, folks want to hurry up and return back to normal. And I like to say we are assisting the community in creating a new normal. If we go back to normal, 
we're going back to a state of vulnerability and increased risk, which is not what we want to do. If we have suffered the impacts from a disaster, we want to build back stronger and more resilient if this situation were to happen again. So recovery, like I said, you won't hear me say we're going back to normal. We're going to a new normal. Um, the diagram on the right, I apologize if it's kind of blurry, but it kind of shows the, the time frame, a visualization of you know, pre-disaster is all the planning stuff, all the outreach, the education. You know, we're telling people, here's what you do if this happens. And like I mentioned, the response, you know, we're really good at going in and saving lives um, when something happens. Um, we do damage assessments. Um, we start figuring out what do people need to start um, building back. But it's this post-disaster um, recovery time frame that, that takes a biggest chunk of a disaster. Um, but this is when all the cameras are off and all the juicy, you know, details of the excitement of the incident has has kind of gone to the wayside and a lot of behind the scene works that happen in recovery that a lot of folks just don't realize. Um, to, be, to begin to understand the disaster process, this, all disasters happen at the local level, um, local municipalities. If a city or a township or a rural community uh, is impacted by a disaster, when they exceed their resources to handle that disaster, that is when us in the county, Central County Emergency Management steps in um, to assess the situation, see what kind of resources we have as a county um, to support the local jurisdiction response. If we don't have enough resources, then we start talking about disaster declarations. Um, we get in touch with the state emergency management uh, department and start to see what resources they can help provide us to, to manage the disaster. Um, the state of local disasters can actually be pre-event, and we usually see this around our wildfire season, where the governor will issue a disaster declaration before fires happen. And the reason they do that is so we can pre-stage resources in those highest vulnerable areas in case something does happen. We're not um, waiting hours for equipment to arrive. It's kind of like pre-staging. It also starts getting um, the emergency operations centers and it starts getting uh, the folks who are involved with response and recovery um, activated and ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, so the uh, I mentioned the, uh, the Board of County Commission is actually the authority to declare a disaster at the recommendation of the emergency manager. Um, and then we contact the state emergency manager. What a local disaster declaration does, it activates our local emergency operations plan, which is pretty much our guidebook on roles and responsibility and how do we as a government respond and recover from a disaster. It's a very big plan. It's, it's about 350 pages long with a whole bunch of annexes and lists and things associated with it. Um, but that comes into play when we have a disaster declaration. And then we have an emergency operations center where we are bringing in all of our partner agencies who have a hand in the response and recovery into one room so we can establish common operating uh, common operating picture uh, shared objectives, so we're all working towards the same goal, um, especially the larger the incident, the more folks we have involved with it, and we want to make sure that we're having a controlled response. The Kansas State of Disaster is declared by the governor at the advice from the Kansas Division of Emergency Management. Um, I'm going to talk about thresholds later on about qualifying for assistance, but a local disaster may not equal a state disaster. Um, and then the state can also declare a disaster. I mentioned that with the wildfires and then the county joins later. So the wildfire is a good example. Um, Governor Kelly issues a stated declaration for wildland fire danger, but Sedgwick County doesn't have any wildfires that happen in that time frame. So we don't do anything with that disaster declaration. But let's say if we did, if we had a wildfire in our jurisdiction and it destroyed a lot of property or livestock or uh, people, then we would declare a local disaster and then also join into the state disaster declaration. And then the next step after the state exceeds resources is a presidential disaster, also known as a major disaster. And that's when the governor goes to FEMA and ultimately to the president. This is where, if it's to this scale, we start looking at federal assistance, especially financial. Um, and I'll go into some of that, what those programs look like. But again, it has to be declared and decli declared or declined by the president. So some of the types of the federal financial aid, and like I mentioned, this only goes into effect under a presidential declaration. So in this situation with Andover and Sedgwick County, um, we did not qualify 
for a presidential disaster declaration, which means the programs I'm about to talk about, we did not qualify for. The, the big program that we hear about a lot, especially in the news, is public assistance. Um, I hate the wording of this because it makes it sound like this is money that goes to the public and it does not. This is a reimbursement for taxing authorities for a percentage of covered expenses on resources that are publicly owned, not to the general public. So our publicly owned infrastructure, our hospitals, our schools, our roads, um, that's what public assistance goes for, is reestablishing our critical lifelines that the government provides to the public. Uh, there's a formula that um, determines how much money of uninsured losses we have to suffer before the federal government will come in and help provide financial aid. For SG, that's Sedgwick County, we have to reach over $2 million in uninsured losses before we can qualify for public assistance. Um, and again, that would be to qualify for a presidential de declaration. For the state of Kansas, it's $4.7 million of uninsured losses. So you can see the thresholds are, are pretty extensive and it takes a lot of uninsured losses before we have the federal government coming in. And then, you know, there's pros and cons to that. You know, if we can handle our disasters locally, that's that's always more optimal um, for our for our residents. Um, if we were to qualify for public assistance, FEMA would cover 75% of the cost, and then local government 25%, but to temp, uh, KDEM, Kansas, actually contributes 10%, leaving us with a 15% match. And again, it's for damage to publicly owned property. This isn't funds that go to the general public. Uh, public assistance has different categories, everything from like debris management. So if we even have like a, a severe winter storm and we have a lot of power lines and a lot of trees that go down, um, and we meet these thresholds, then we wind up having public assistance that meets into some of these categories. And I won't get into all the different categories, but there's just, there's several of them. The next um, federal financial aid assistance is individual assistance. And this is even harder to get than public assistance is. Um, usually it takes something like a, a major hurricane before individual assistance or maybe some of the wildfires in California that entire communities are, are being impacted. Um, fortunately, we don't have a whole lot of disasters to that scale here in Kansas. Once in a while, we'll have an EF5 tornado that may go through um, like Greensburg, for example. Um, but for the most part, most of our disasters don't quite qualify for the level of assistance that the federal government provides. Um, the Small Business Administration Low Interest Loans or SBA, we hear about this quite a bit too in the news. These are low, even though it says small business loans, it's actually available to citizens or businesses. So this could be um, available to individuals to use to help rebuild their homes uh, and get themselves back on their feet. Again, only when our disaster is large enough to qualify for a presidential disaster declaration. So a picture up to the right, I showed, this is the Andover YMCA um, that suffered over $12 million in damages. And a lot of folks thought right off the bat that that would get us over that threshold and we would qualify for federal assistance, um, but we did not. That does not count towards our threshold because it is not public infrastructure and it was insured. So even though we have extensive damages and it looks like there's no way we could handle this on our own because of it being insured and not a public infrastructure, uh, we did not qualify for um, assistance for that. The bottom right corner is a picture of our emergency operations center. This was the first few hours after the tornado struck. And this is us gathering different information from the field, trying to figure out how much damage was done, what kind of um, demographic information do we already know about the area that was hit. So our GIS folks, our mapping folks, and our appraiser's office plays really heavy into the beginning when we're uh, assessing the damage path of the disaster and then trying to calculate um, what we know about that area. So do we know, is it a vulnerable population that the majority will not be insured? Or in this case, like in Andover, did it hit a neighborhood that has a lot of insurance? Um, so that plays huge into how we respond and how we recover from these type of disasters. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the National Preparedness Goal that I mentioned earlier. Um, this has a lot of information on here, but these are the five mission areas or phases of the disasters, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. 
And underneath these are core capabilities or core functions or activities that we need to address um, that to risks to our jurisdictions. So planning, public information warning, and operational coordination, whoop, my apologies, all apply to all phases. All phases of disasters we have to plan for. We have public information and warning obligations to consider for all phases, as well as operational coordination. Um, you'll see by the chart, it kind of moves left to right and it falls under the categories. All the way to the right is where we talk about recovery. This is the, we want to recover our infrastructures, our community lifelines. We want our basic needs to get met. But then we have the longer term recovery of economic, economic recovery, our health and social service systems, housing, permanent housing, not just temporary housing, and then also preserving natural and cultural resources that may have been impacted, um, protecting and or restoring our natural and cultural resources. And again, all of these are behind the scenes. It's it's not the juicy, exciting things that the news media comes out, videotapes, or we have residents out uh, recording. This is the stuff that is not so juicy with the disaster, but it, it is a critical phase of disaster management that we just really don't um, have enough attention on, I don't think. So the eight recovery core capabilities, and this goes back to that chart I showed you, these are the ones on the right, planning, public information and warning, Operational coordination happens in all of the phases. Um, we want whole community engagement, and we'll talk about what that means here in a little bit. We want to have common objectives that we're working towards. We want to communicate um, accurate and clear information to those who are impacted, as well as those who are assisting the efforts in response and recovery. And we want to communicate threats and hazards before they occur. What are people planning for? What are the things that are likely to happen that they may face? And then the operational coordination is setting up that unified structure um, that gets all the stakeholders in the room and that we are creating a common operating picture that we're all working towards and shared objectives that we are all working towards. The economic recovery, and this goes into this is more just recovery, is returning the economic and business activities to a healthy state. And you'll notice it doesn't say go back to normal. It goes back to a healthy state, however that's going to be defined post-disaster. And then we can, uh, this is an opportunity to even develop new business and employment opportunities as well as we are rebuilding and considering how to build back stronger and better, um, may create other job opportunities for folks. Health and social services, um, networks to promote resilience, independence, health, and that includes behavior health and well being. Um, behavior health is starting to really take. Um, uh, take leaps as far as becoming an important issue that we are uh, addressing. Even during the response phase now, we're starting to throw um, more considerations into behavior health and how do we get mental health resources out quickly uh, to folks who just, um, just experienced something very traumatic. And the same thing with our first responders who are out there. Um, you know, if the disaster is bad enough or there's injuries and even death, um, you know, our first responders can also be traumatized right in the very beginning response phase. Um, so we want to get behavioral health and mental health resources um, engaged sooner than later. Um, housing solutions. So when we have a major disaster and we have several folks who may have just lost their homes or are displaced, you all have temporary shelters or we may be able to put them in hotels. The recovery phase looks at the long-term housing. Are we going to rebuild a neighborhood in the same area? Are we going to rebuild it in the same manner? Or are we going to do things smarter and stronger um, to be more resilient for future disasters. Again, going back to, we don't want to just rebuild to normal because we were vulnerable and we suffered impacts uh, from the disaster. So we want to look at how do we come back stronger uh, to handle it if it happens again. Uh, infrastructure systems, these are talking about like utilities, healthcare systems, school systems, the things that communities need to have going um, to be an active community. And then again, minimizing health and safety threats. During recovery, when there's a lot of folks that are still out there cleaning debris and rebuilding things, we have a lot of opportunity for injury and illness that we want to make sure we're communicating ways for folks to be doing things safely. Um, and then the natural and cultural resources. As much as we can, protecting resources and historic properties or reserving them, or I was not reserving them, preserving them or conserving them, rehabilitating them, restoring them to consistent with the post-disaster community priorities. 
Um, again, a lot of a lot of this discussion doesn't take place in front of the news cameras, but these are all things that are going on behind the scenes in the recovery phase. And then we want to make sure that one, we are familiar with our environmental and historic preservation laws, and that we are actually executing those orders and laws uh, during our recovery. So I mentioned recovery kind of has phases within itself. There is a short-term phase to recovery. This is where we're trying to reestablish our lifelines. Our basic needs need to be met. We need to get food. We need to get water. We need to get shelter. Um, the response is when you're going in and you're saving lives. This is, okay, everyone's out of the debris. Now what do we do? And that's the short-term recovery. During this time frame, we also start coordinating resources, anticipating long-term recovery needs. And in a little bit, I'll talk about a multi-agency resource center that we set up. Um, but again, this all is happening not only during the recovery, but these are things we should be planning and preparing for even before a disaster happens. We know there's going to be short-term recovery. We know there's going to be long-term recovery. So the long-term recovery restoring economic activity, rebuilding facilities and family housing with, again, attention to long-term mitigation. How can we reduce the risk for the next time this happens? Um, and recovery phase is that prime, perfect phase for us to really take a hard look at that. Um, reconstruction, repair, rebuilding activities intended to restore a community. We're making permanent repairs to bridges, roads, buildings. Again, I mentioned we're survivors returning to permanent housing. Uh, community redevelopment activities, and then long-term development planning. How do we get our economy and everything uh, back to that healthy state? Um, and you can see by the chart, um, you know, the disaster happens. Short-term recovery is usually, you know, maybe a day within to a week or two weeks. The intermediate is weeks into months. And that's kind of where we are right now with the Andover tornado is we're, in, we're six months in, just over six months now. Um, and I'll talk about what we're still doing for our residents that were impacted. But we're kind of going into the intermediate, into that long-term recovery phase of this particular disaster. Um, so we will talk about that here in a minute. I mentioned whole community involvement. We have to be make sure that we have strategic planning that is inclusive to the entire community. Uh, the last thing we want to do is, is have any intentional or unintentional discrimination against, especially against any kind of vulnerable populations. Um, you know, what are the needs of the elderly, veterans, children, individuals with disabilities, and those with access and functional needs? Uh, we need to consider different backgrounds, um, race, ethnicity, uh, those with limited English proficiency. One challenge we have being a government entity is sometimes we come across folks that are, they don't trust the government um, or they're scared of the government and they don't wanna work with us even though we're trying to help them rebuild and recover. And this is where our private organizations will come in and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but we have to make sure that we are reaching the entire population. Uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, and in even animals. We, a lot of times don't think about animals um, with our response and recovery plans. And that is certainly something that we need to be considering because especially in Kansas, uh, you know, if, if livestock is impacted, that could have a huge impact on how a community responds and recovers to a disaster. Um, same thing with agricultural, you know, if we have ma massive crop loss, um, that can destroy a community. So we have to think, again, all hazards, we have to think big scale when we're talking about disaster recovery and helping communities get back to, to their new normal. So the national uh, FEMA has, or Homeland Security through FEMA has frameworks for every disaster phase. So there is a national disaster preparedness fr framework. There's a mitigation framework. Um, there is a response framework and there is a recovery framework. And what this does is it provides states and local governments kind of a template or a rule book, if you will, to kind of mimic and, and think about things that are pretty common to any kind of a disaster. Again, we're planning for all hazards. Um, but in the disaster recovery framework, they have eight guiding principles. And then the state has a recovery plan that kind of mimics this. And then the local government um, has these planning principles as well. So just, again, a little bit of background about the tornadoes. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that on April 29th, there was uh, multiple tornadoes. The tornadoes that hit our local area, there was the EF3 tornado, which is what everyone has called the Andover tornado, but that actually struck down in Sedgwick County, rural Sedgwick County. 
um, and then moved into Andover and a little bit further north into uh, northeast into rural Butler County. There was another tornado shortly thereafter that was near Rosalia, a very rural small community um, that just had a couple small properties that were that were damaged. But just to kind of give a scope of what this looked like, uh, we had uh, 228 structures in Andover and Butler County and 96 structures impacted in Sedgwick County. We had over 200 residencies uh, severely damaged or destroyed between all the jurisdictions. And then they estimated um, cost and damages, and this is the appraised value. This isn't insured or uninsured, um, but uh, about 41, 42 million dollars. Um, and that number will continuously change because we are still working with insurance companies um, and getting costs and damage assessments and stuff. So again, it's really easy to look at this and be like, oh, wow, that is a lot. FEMA has to be coming in to help us with that. But again, this particular tornado hit a very, very insured population and hit a lot of infrastructure that was insured. Um, so we did not qualify for that assistance. So, you know, what does that mean? How does a community recover from something that did all of this damage, caused millions of dollars in damage? How are we expected to recover from that? Um, and like I mentioned, uh, most were insured. That is a good thing. When the federal government comes in to help a community recover, it's not going to be to get folks to recover to a new normal. It's kind of going to be to recover and get your basic needs met and to get you on the track to rebuild. Insurance companies are going to cover much more extensive on losses than what the federal government can provide. Uh, but we did, between the jurisdictions, we did have vulnerable population needs to address. We had elderly. Uh, we did have some uninsured. We had undocumented, non-English speaking family, and we had children involved. So um, again, part of our recovery team that I'll talk about in a little bit is to make sure that everybody is being taken care of and that we understand what the needs are and that everybody has equal access to the resources to recover from this disaster. Um, I mentioned, you know, when the federal government can't come in or the government can't come in and help us recover, what, how do we recover? And that is through our non-governmental organizations, um, voluntary, faith-based, philanthropic and community organizations that do respond and recover from disaster. We've got a lot of local resources here. We're very, very fortunate um, that are very experienced in disaster response and recovery, and they are heavily engaged um, within even our community, and then they expand out to the region and to the state. Um, several small community-based nonprofits, again, like I mentioned, they're very experienced. Um, and they can provide targeted services to groups such as children, those with disabilities, those with uh, function and ac access and functional needs, uh, veterans groups, to address some of those specific needs that those populations may have that uh, need a little bit more undivided attention. We make sure that we're matching up the unmet needs with the people who have the resources. Um, a lot of our NGOs are experienced with managing money. Uh, they have a lot of manpower and then the materials to meet unmet needs of the community. Um, and oh my gosh, we're so fortunate. We have the United Way and the Great Plains United Methodist among some other folks experienced in volunteer and donation management. These are both huge undertakings after a disaster. Um, you know, we saw this with Andover, literally while the tornado was still on the ground, we had responders and we had people you know, going into the community to see how they can help. That all has to be managed, safety, is paramount in response and recovery in, in all the phases of disaster, um, but specifically response and recovery is making sure our volunteers um, are, are safe out there and we don't add to any kind of um, injuries or illnesses. And then donation management, be it tangible items or um, financial. Um, and then the thing you want to do is build these relationships before disasters happen. And Again, we're very blessed, very fortunate here locally. We have already had strong relationships with the Red Cross, Salvation Army, United Way, the Great Plains United Methodist, amongst all, a lot of the other organizations that um, are actively helping us recover from this disaster. So I mentioned Multi-Agency Resource Center, or what we call a MARC. And what we do locally, and this is in our local emergency operations plan, is when we know there's um, our community has unmet needs, we will bring in resources into a single location, or we try to do our best to bring it into a, a single location. 
where our survivors can come in and get assistance with insurance. They can pick up cleanup kits, their basic needs, toiletries, water, some uh, food, um, just things to help get them started, um, to get things moving along for, for their uh, recovery. Um, Salvation Army, they'll go out to the sites and deliver meals out to folks. Uh, one thing we brought into this tornado response was pet therapy. We had um, organizations bringing in animals, um, dogs, cats. We even had a rabbit in a stroller. Um, but not only did it help those survivors when they went out into the communities, but it helped our first responders, too, who were working day in and day out and putting in some really long hours just to have a break from all the stress and, you know, have a little animal time, little pet therapy. It was it was a really, really um positive light in the middle of all the chaos so uh, something that again to think about a lot of folks don't think about um, within this multi-agency resource center we also had the health department so i mentioned safety concerns for volunteers and for our residents a lot of disasters we get concerned with tetanus uh, maybe hepatitis a so vaccinations were being provided free uh, through the health department to our residents our first responders and, and volunteers who were helping up with the debris cleanup so um, a lot of resources coming together and what we want to try to have as a central location. Um, oh, yeah, the food bank, too. We had meals being delivered. We had tons and tons of food, um, which is fantastic um, for a multi-agency resource center. Our private sectors all came together as well. Um, I just threw some of our uh, local partners that were heavily involved with this tornado response um, helping to retain and provide jobs, keeping folks um, employed, because a lot of worries is financial after a disaster happens of how do I pay my bills? I need to go to work. I need to rebuild a house. There's a lot of things um, that employers can kind of help with some of this. A lot of our infrastructure, our utilities, our financial institutions, insurance, healthcare systems are privately owned or private sector entities. Um, so again, we want to have relationships with them before disasters happen. And we want to make sure we're collectively working to rebuild and recover from the disaster. Um, a lot of goods and services to the community. Um, like the first few hours after the tornado, once the first responders were kind of clearing the areas and kind of saying, yes, you know, we did our search and rescue. I know Lowe's was out there delivering totes for people to put belongings in. Um, Casey's was out delivering pizza. Uh, we had insurance companies, all various different types of insurance companies going out there working with their, their clients and everything. Um, our utility companies, Evergy, Kansas Gas, Black Hills Energy, it was all hands on deck when this tornado went through. Um, and it's it's a really impressive sight to see all of the coordinated efforts and all of this coming together. Um, supply chain, um, we know right now there's some supply chain challenges, which is impacting our recovery from this tornado. Um, a lot of houses need to be rebuilt. Um, and even if folks have their insurance um, claims processed, the materials may not be available, or if they have the materials, the manpower to rebuild their homes may not be there. So again, this is another reason why there's a long-term recovery process is you have a lot of folks with a lot of needs in a small amount of area um, that's gonna be competing for resources. So recovery does take a long time. Um, and then having private sectors, we you know, restore and making sure that they're, they have what they need to, to be continuously active in the community, making sure we have a stable tax base. And a lot of these organizations set volunteer teams out. Um, many, many local businesses wanted the opportunity that, hey, we want to have employees meet on a Saturday morning and help clean up a park or help clean up a neighborhood. Um, so a lot of manpower support from our private sectors. So again, this is, again, reiterating that whole community plays a role into disaster preparedness, response, and recovery. And again, when we're talking about risk mitigation, how do we rebuild back stronger and smarter is we got to use the experts who know about this kind of stuff. We need to bring them into the room, have these conversations about how we're going to rebuild and what are things that we can afford and what are things that we can do um, to be uh, stronger and better for next time. So I mentioned we're, we're in the long-term recovery phase of the Andover tornado. Um, we have case management overseen by United Way of the Plains. This is what they do for us. Um, it's in our local emergency operations plan. They're kind of the organization that we rely on. Um, they're right now, they're managing over 190 cases for those who have been impacted with the tornado. They're in constant communication with, with um, these folks to make sure that we understand what are their unmet needs. 
what is insurance covering? What is insurance not covering? If they don't have insurance, what are the things that we can help them with? Um, again, a very fortunate thing for this community here is we have uh, a lot of generous donors who donated funds um, to help us meet those unmet needs. So it's an equal balance with this committee, uh, making sure that we are being fair and equitable and that we understand what the unmet needs are and that we're assisting everybody. So we don't want to have somebody who has, you know, they, they're asking for $30,000 to replace their car, but I have somebody who doesn't have a place to live. Or I have a, somebody who has a second vehicle and they're just out with one vehicle versus one person who may not have a vehicle to get to and from work. So this committee, um, and this is kind of a best practice. This doesn't happen all the time with long-term recovery committees. This is only the second time we've done this here locally. Um, the first time was through a flood in the Mulvane area in 2016, I believe. Um, and then we have a long-term recovery meeting to manage this tornado. And we have elected officials. We have both county government emergency managers involved, the city of Andover administration. We've got nonprofit organizations, multiple private businesses, and the United Way all coming together to form this committee. Uh, we established bylaws again, to define eligibility, what available assistance, what are things we will cover, what are things we're not going to cover, because this is donor money management. Um, and like I said, United Way is the umbrella, and then we help um, kind of manage the administrative process of some of this. Um, we have bylaws, and again, it, it's just to make sure that we are not getting our personal biases and we're not getting opinions and thoughts in there, except this is what we will and what we will not cover. We have routine meetings with documented meeting minutes, and we have objective case management reviews. So United Way, their case managers have the relationships with our folks who have been impacted. The committee, we don't get any of their information. We don't know names. We don't know addresses. We just know what the situation is. Like we have a family of four who lost their house, lost their vehicle. They had insurance, but insurance isn't covering this. And this is where us as a committee comes together and say, okay, yes, they're asking for $5,000 to help with their deductibles. It's in our bylaws that this is an eligible thing that we will spend money for. And then we give them that assistance. Um, so again, it's, it's objective. Um, it's just a way for us to make sure that we're not um, having any kind of biases towards distributing um, resources for those who have needs. Um, this Committee also help coordinate cleanup days. Again, whole community engagement, people want to help. So we try to help find opportunities to connect those who are volunteering with those who need help. Um, so we make a lot of those relationships. Uh, planning anniversary events may not sound like something that is important, but it is important. Um, we just had the six month anniversary, if you will. We had some recognition ceremonies. Um, when we hit the one year anniversary, there's going to be some events, um, again, probably sharing you know, giving kudos to first responders and the residents uh, and kind of giving a progress of how things have come, um, how the community has recovered, where we're we at, where we're we going, that kind of thing. And then it's important to provide recovery progress updates to the community. And this can be a challenge because again, a lot of this stuff is all happening behind the scenes. It's not juicy. It's not a bunch of action items. You know, we don't have a bunch of first responders going in and saving lives. It's a lot of us sitting at a table, having discussions and, and uh, making phone calls and things of that nature. But again, it's such a critical piece of community resilience that it's a phase of disasters that we've got to keep on the radar and we need to plan and prepare for uh, before disasters strike. So uh, I mentioned, you know, prepare and plan to recover. Recovery is pretty much the final phase of a disaster, if you will, but we need to plan for it in the very beginning. We know if a disaster happens, we're going to have to recover from it. So let's get relationships built before then. Let's get any kind of agreements in writing beforehand, you know, mutual aid agreements or memorandums of understanding. Um, coordinate pl recovery planning in all phases. When we're talking about protection, when we're talking about prevention, response, mitigation, what are some of the things for the recovery side of it that we should also be including in these plans? Um, one thing that we have not done well on, and this is an improvement thing that we want to stress, is promoting the importance of insurance policies and keeping them current. A lot of our residents had insurance, but they quickly realized they were underinsured because they hadn't updated their insurance policy in decades. 
um, and people also managing expectations. What is covered by your insurance policy and what is not? Um, and, you know, insurance isn't going to come in and just take care of everything and you don't have any responsibility in this. There has to be, um, you know, deductible knowledge. And there's some things like flood insurance is a prime example. Um, you know, your basic homeowner's insurance is not going to cover flood damage. You have to get a separate policy for that. And then renters. Uh, a lot of renters do not understand that whoever owns that property, their insurance will cover rebuilding but it will not cover the contents inside of that building. So all of your personal possessions, if you're a renter, you need to get renter's insurance. And one of our improvement areas that we want to do better next time is to really start stressing this during our prevention um, outreach activities that we're communicating and talking about insurance before disasters happen. Uh, recovery plans. We want to make sure folks know how to evacuate, how to shelter in place, and what sheltering needs they may have. You know, again, going back to vulnerable populations, you know, do we have um, elderly who have medical equipment needs? Do we have access and functional needs where we need to have certain accommodations um, to help shelter folks? Animals is a big thing. Um, you know, if we have to evacuate, you know, who, where are you taking your animals to? Um, again, that's part of recovery, but that's also part of planning and preparing for disaster. And we always talk about the emergency supply kit. And then planning assumptions. So even though we're doing all of this planning, we still have to assume that some of our stakeholders may be impacted by the disaster. They may be displaced or maybe unable to access the community. So how can we work around that? Um, we have to recognize that our social networks and our normal mechanisms in the community are compromised. They're fractured. They just went you know, through a disaster. So all of that loss of structure um, it is very overwhelming and we need to manage that through our recovery process and make sure that we're all again working under a common operating procedure to restore these mechanisms and these social networks um, to help the community uh, come back together and, and stay engaged and recover from it. Um, and then the continuous assessment of threats, hazards, and impacts. You know, this is important too as we're talking about risk mitigation and building resiliency and building things stronger and, and um, more capable to handle the impacts of disaster, but we want to make sure we're also not creating additional risk. There has to be very careful assessments of the risk mitigation measures that we're putting in place, um, looking at down the road, will this have a negative impact? So again, bringing all the smart people in the room to have these type of discussions on, on how to uh, build back stronger, but again, not creating additional risk down the road. And then again, I can't emphasize this enough, recovery is more than just returning to pre-disaster conditions. It's not returning to normal, it's returning to a new normal. It's defining a new normal and in, in learning how to um, handle, again, the impacts of disaster. So final takeaways and some resources, plan and prepare for recovery before disaster occurs. Um, recovery takes time and resources. And there's no way around that. I mean, things can't seem to go fast enough to help our folks recover from disaster, uh, but it is just the reality. Recovery is going to take time. Um, and there's different phases of recovery. The short recovery where we're reestablishing our basic needs, our basic lifelines, the intermediate to long-term where again, we're looking at building a resilient community and building things back stronger. And then recovery takes the whole community. You know, we talked about the, our nonprofit organizations, our private sectors, our government agencies. Everybody has to work together um, to get a community to, to build back um, and recover from a disaster. And then I've shared some links. Uh, these are just a few of the plethora of, of information things that are out there. We have the National Response Framework that also goes into the National Recovery Framework. Um, there's actually a recovery management toolkit um, that FEMA provides for emergency managers and local officials to, um, you know, there's checklists, there's plans to think about. Uh, ready.gov is, is great for citizens and residents and for us to share to the community, are you ready guide. Um, again, the things to think about before a disaster happens so you're better prepared um, to respond and recover. The Red Cross has a lot of information on disaster preparedness and recovery. And then actually even the National Fire Protection Association has a, a standard on continuity and crisis management that even extends into businesses and how they can prepare um, for disasters and how do they recover. Um, one of the challenges we have with business owners is sometimes if their home is impacted and their business is impacted, they're having to recover like twice as hard. They're trying to recover a business and their home. 
And that's something, again, long-term recovery committee and our government agencies are going to be looking for those type of unmet needs. So just to kind of reiterate a lot of information, but like I said, I wanted to focus on recovery because we always talk about preparedness. We talk about response, but we don't talk about the non-juicy things that happen behind the scenes. But emergency management, we're here to, to help communities and individuals prepare, mitigate against, respond, and recover from all hazard events. So we're really not even training folks to prepare for a tornado. We're preparing for the impacts of a tornado, the loss of structure, the loss of power, the loss of food and water. You know, floods provide similar challenges where we may have power outages, um, lack of access to critical services that we need. Um, you know, winter storms, you know, they can do a lot of damage too, where they're knocking out power. You know, if we have trees and power lines falling on people's homes, you know, we may have some displaced folks. So again, just again, preparing for any kind of disruption on a large scale of how do we handle it at the individual level and how do we handle it at the community level. And that is what emergency management is here for, is to help bring all of that together. Um, the picture on the left is actually our public safety building. Our emergency operations center is housed on this uh, property. We're on Main Street, uh, just north of the downtown area. Um, and then the picture on the right was us. We were actually at the recent air show and we were doing some outreach information and handing out some uh, disaster preparedness um, guides and pamphlets and booklets and things to folks and talking to, to everyone about reminding ourselves the importance of disaster preparedness. So with that, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and open for any questions, discussions, or if you guys want to see any resources, I have the links I can pull up. Uh, just let me know. Thank you, Julie, for the interesting talk. Um, questions from the audience? You're free to ask the question or type in the question in the chat. Okay, well, with that, uh, there's a lot of information I just kind of gave out. If you guys have any questions or want more information, um, we're here to, to be a, a, an asset for you guys, for, for the whole community. So you can contact us, give us a call. Um, we have a webpage, sedgwickcounty.org slash emergency management. Um, and you'll probably see us out in the community. Um, we're, we've got a department of five now that we're gonna be going out doing a lot of outreach uh, information, doing some education and training. Um, and again, we're still heavily involved with our long-term recovery for the uh, local tornado disaster that we just had. So, I, I had one question. Um, so, from the learnings from all of the uh, response uh, recovery process that you were talking about, uh, you talked about the short-term, intermediate, and the long-term recovery process from a disaster. So. Is there something you'd like to see improve in the next uh, several years for a future um, faster or more improved uh, response uh, in terms of uh, recovery from a disaster? Uh, one thing I would like is um, one of the things we realize is when the excitement of an event is going on like this, this this tornado had a lot of eyes and ears people were photographing it videoing it um everyone wants to rush and help right away and there has to be a uh safety pause if you will our first responders have to go in and do search and rescue and we need to make sure that we don't have folks getting hurt by trying to rush in and help everybody it's such an admirable thing of course neighbors are going to help neighbors um, but we kind of need that response to be able to pause a little bit um, before all coming in because it's a lot to manage all at once. So when you're trying to manage all the volunteers and resources coming in at the same time we're doing search and rescue, um, we're working with our partners to when we activate, we need to probably do things a little bit more in phases instead of everything all at one time because that gets very overwhelming. Um, and then an another th thing um, is managing expectations. Um, a lot of what we felt, even from our elected officials, is because what they saw in their minds was a massive disaster that we were going to have to have FEMA coming in. We needed that national level attention, and we didn't. We didn't qualify. Uh, there was a lot of misunderstandings about why, um, but 
there's pros and cons to that as well. So I guess communicating that is, that's kind of part of us on emergency managers is just managing expectations from the beginning is a lot of folks just don't expect FEMA to come running in and, and bail us out and help us recover that we need to do some of that stuff on our own work with our insurance companies and make sure that we are resilient within ourselves. Thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Uh, so the question is from Nathan. Um, so regarding the whole community involvement, where do you get most of that data or information regarding residents and aspects of persons for local or rural communities, vulnerabilities, needs, connections, relationships, etc.? So what we use for that, um, we actually have what we call a social vulnerability index that kind of our health departments actually and our medical communities have a lot of this. Again, this is that joint partnership of working with our agencies um, that we already kind of have mapped out some of our areas and neighborhoods that, that may have more needs, more vulnerabilities. Um, we, I'm going to just be very uh, transparent with it. We have not done very good with communicating and getting preparedness information out to some of these areas that we can do better on. That outreach of, um, especially those with non-English speaking, um, we're working really hard right now to bring some Spanish, um, uh, yes, the CDC Social Vulnerability Index. Thank you, Ethan, yes. Um, is bringing multiple languages. So even if we have tornado sirens going off, if we have not communicated to folks what that means and what they're supposed to do, what's the point? And so we're, we're doing, a lot of work ahead of things right now to get things in multiple languages. Um, Thank you. The, there is another question. I probably missed it. Uh, Ethan asked a question before. Are there particular groups in the community, such as vulnerable groups, that you try to reach in your outreach efforts in educating about disaster preparedness? Yeah, yeah. So one thing that we are bringing, we just started this initiative last year. It's called the Community Emergency Response Team, or CERT program, where we are training neighbors to help neighbors um, respond to disasters and recover. Um, and when we do that, we're going out to the neighborhoods. So we're working with the culture that is already established in that neighborhood. So, um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of non-English speaking folks, and we're going to provide that training to them in their native languages. The challenge we have is bringing instructors together and bringing the materials all together to make that happen. Um, but that is an initiative we just started this year that we've already had a couple classes and we have some more plans to uh, work with our Spanish speaking community. Um, right off the bat to really get into some of these neighborhoods that need help with some of that stuff. The elderly, we're working with a lot of our um, assisted living and healthcare facilities to make sure that we, we understand what some of the needs are with the elderly, making sure they're prepared um, and that they have what they need to, to respond and recover. Um, veteran groups, um, I'm actually on a panel now with the a Veteran Advisory Council um, that we are talking about disaster preparedness and response and making sure that we have veteran resources um, available to, to veterans who may have some uh, specific needs. So we're really trying to get out there. There's just, there's a lot of groups um, that we're still trying to reach. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of raised hands. Uh, Mara, do you want to ask your question? I think Maria was before me. Uh, Maria, you want to go ahead first? Yeah, um, so I was curious, Julie, um, if there's any kind of framework that you use for your outreach and by framework I mean like the Sendai framework or the HIGO framework or something that like sort of influences how you do outreach does that make sense yeah we we actually don't um myself and the, the crew that I have here we're, we've only been here for about a year and a half two years so we're kind of a fairly new team um what we're starting with right now is to get outreach out to some of the big events that a lot of our folks are attending and trying to get into, you know, when we have uh, appreciation months for different ethnicities mm -hmm. that we're wanting to start getting engaged with some of that, uh, those activities and just getting out there more. But uh, we haven't been there yet. Part of it is too COVID kind of shut us down in our outreach and we're just now really getting back into the community. Uh, but that is certainly something that we have plans for, but I wouldn't say we have a structured framework. It's just more of us just trying to take advantage of the activities that we know are existing out there. Okay, thank you. 
I'm going to comment a little bit more, more than ask questions. I really appreciate your presentation. It's very comprehensive. And you mentioned lots of things that we as a group discussed before. And one of the examples is after Andover tornado happened, we had lots of conversation and even uh, wrote a piece of a case study, what would have happened if the tornado you know, was going through the middle of Wichita or, you know, moving east a little bit more and, you know, kind of what we are learning from that. And you commented on outreach and framework. Those are other things that we uh, discussed quite a bit. And I very much appreciate the whole idea of new normal because in our minds, it also applies to COVID actually, you know, Things that we are really looking into new normal after situations like this. And my question would have been about outreach, but you have answered some of those. And along the same lines, um, being as a team at the university, we're also discussing outreach in terms of uh, STEM education and other areas. So I would say, if we can keep connected or maybe do some things together, that might have been, uh, that would be a question, how much you are open to more conversations about uh, things like this and things that we would like to do in terms of outreach and education. Yeah, uh, definitely. And I've actually, there's um, there's been another professor uh, with WSU that I just met with, um, oh gosh, maybe two or three weeks ago. Um, and talking about even some of this disaster preparedness and the talk about even insurance and stuff to uh, students of, of getting some education out. Uh, we talked about building a community emergency response team, a campus specific CERT team. Uh, one, giving students some opportunity for leadership um, opportunities as well, and then also educating them, um, you know, as they transition into adulthood of the things that they need to be prepared for um, to handle when these things happen. Um, so yeah, definitely interested, especially on the outreach side of it. Um, I don't think like we have been engaged enough and I'm really excited for this opportunity. You had mentioned you guys looking at if this had just gone a little bit to the east um, with this tornado and we had the same exact thoughts of this could have been such a ca catastrophic disaster, um, you know, and, you know, what could have that have looked like? And so I'm actually really interested in what you guys may have talked about and seen or analyzed um, I didn't talk about it in the beginning, but I'm a PhD student in emergency management myself. I'm on my oh, dissertation okay. phase. Um, so I definitely have a strong in interest in case studies and what we can take lessons learned from disasters. Um, one thing I didn't mention either is we did an extensive after action report for this tornado response and recovery. Um, it's about 50 pages long, but things that we noticed that went well, things that we can improve upon for next time. Uh, we literally just presented that to our elected officials this week. So um, if you guys are interested in seeing that document, I'd be more than willing to, to share or discuss some of those things that were in there um, with what we saw and observed on our end. Uh, I, I think, I'm sure we would love to see that. And uh, as much as we're thinking about what happened after this after, in terms of outreach, we are very, very much interested what we can do for resilience and preparedness before a potential disaster or whatever the disaster might be. So One of the major things that we identified as a deficiency is with outreach, even during the recovery, is we were relying heavily on social media and the local media to push out information. And then about a week into our recovery, we realized our residents still weren't getting the information and we were getting frustrated but it was because they weren't on their phones, they weren't on their computers, they weren't watching TV. So, you know, we had to start reverse engineering again and going back to the old traditional pen and paper of giving them something tangible that says, here's what to expect, here's where you go to get resources, instead of relying on heavily on that social media and TV. It's great if people are on it, but a lot of our folks in those first few days and weeks, their priority is getting their belongings, you know, together and organization and stuff, not not scroll on Facebook and Twitter. So that was one of the major things with outreach that we're looking at is how do we do that better next time? Thank you. I had a question and in, in fact, I wanted to um, 
hear a little bit about uh, what I was interested in, concurrency of two disasters, and you kind of reflected on it because you mentioned about the supply chain management issue because of the um, co because of COVID pandemic and that affected the rebuilding of houses because of the after in the aftermath of the end of our tornado. So my question is um, such a situation that kind of uh, looks at the interaction of the two different uh, disaster scenarios. Uh, the long-term recovery committee, did they plan for such scenario? Is, there, is it just that they faced it and they kind of uh, proposed solutions or there were something in the planning stages that these situations might occur and you kind of plan for that as well? Well, a couple of things. Um... So we didn't initially plan for a dual disaster, but what wound up happening, and I'm, I'm freely sharing this because we briefed our electives and everybody's, we did have a small COVID outbreak within our incident command team. Um, again, but we relied on our health department partners who were engaged from the very beginning, who helped us manage that. Um, when that happened, that also led into us thinking more about the supply chain challenges that we were gonna have. And again, a lot of our job is to manage expectations. So not making any false promises to people saying, yeah, you'll have a new house in six months. Instead, communicating the reality of, you know, this, we're facing challenging times. Here's who's working on your behalf. But again, managing those expectations is, is crucial for a good recovery um, to avoid and minimize frustration from being given false pro promises. Thank you. Maria, I see a raised hand. I don't know if it was the raised hand from before or you have a new question. Okay, so yeah, are there any other questions for our speaker? I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak on this. And if there's anything I can participate in, uh, like I said, I've got a really vested interest in, in what you guys are doing with resiliency and um, yeah, if there's any meetings or any committees or anything that you think I could be involved by all means, I'm very, very interested. So uh, definitely reach out and, and let me know. <laughs> Thank you. And this is very helpful to know as well. Uh, definitely, we will uh, be in touch with you. And we really appreciate uh, you being here and providing us with all the information. Your talk was very interesting and very helpful, beneficial for our group as well. Great. Thank you very much. Um, you all have a fantastic day. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for joining in and attending the seminar. You all have a good rest of the day. Bye.